So, for those of you, um, I'm, you know, the names, the seats do not have names on them, so you can move. Okay. Um, you are awesome. It's awesome. I'm just saying. <laughs> I hope you as much as I did. All right. <laughs> Thank Take you. care. Bye. Thanks for coming out. They came all the way from Thousand Oaks. But they still got beat out by the Arizonians. <laughs> Big round for Arizona. Huh? There's one more. I know. He's coming to my five day training next week. Toronto, you're a resident here too. You bounce back and forth. You didn't come here just for me. Don't don't fib. Oh, I came from Maryland. No, you did. Three years. Ago. Three years ago. We came from separate states together. All right. So what we've talked about from from the, the early parts of today, we talked about weight. We talked about uh, you know weight issues and how. The weight itself is almost never the problem. More than 25 pounds, 30 pounds, you're not looking at, at uh, lifestyle anymore. You're looking at body armor. You're looking at things that have a significant emotional component that the weight is satisfying. Usually security or safety. Usually security or safety. Now whether that security comes from uh, not having enough growing up or uh, safety coming from having an appearance that detracts or deters attention, unwanted masculine attention, or some point in between, right, where, where food becomes a substitute for security in terms of connection and love and emotional nurturing. It's still the symptom. Satisfy the, the requirement that that behavior is designed to uh, accomplish, and the weight will tend to normalize. At least the behaviors that led to the weight gain and the maintenance will tend to normalize. There may be other things that have to be done uh, to facilitate that, but long and short of it, weight issues beyond 25 to 30 pounds are the result of some form of trauma. Now, when I say the word trauma, we have to change our definition of trauma. Because when we think of trauma, we think about horrible things. We think about car crashes and war zones and sexual molestation and all of these horrid things. Right? And, and we should. But we also need to expand our understanding of trauma to anything the nervous system views as life-threatening. Even if it's getting your toy taken away when you're a two-year-old even if it's mommy and daddy yelling at each other in front of you. Even if it's being alone in a room or in a room with people and nobody's playing with you. These things are just as trauma-inducing as war zones. And in more cases than not, the root cause of the people who wind up in my chair. Okay. Regard and here's the best part. It's, 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 it's once kind of paradoxical and scary and amazingly cool at the same time. Everybody who studies from who suffers from trauma isn't broken. They're not broken. They feel that way. God knows they feel that way. A trauma, when you're manifesting symptoms is the sign of a system functioning properly. It's just nobody taught you the dynamics of the system, so you didn't know what to do when the system did what it was programmed to do. So let me give you a basic idea, uh, a basic understanding that I acquired, I acquired this really, a lot of the, the, the subtleties of it uh, from, from uh, again, I'm gonna quote him again, Brent Baum, who I think is a tremendous, tremendous resource. His stuff is a little dense. Um, but for those of you who really are called to do this work, who I lovingly call a special kind of stupid, it's one thing to come to a seminar like to fix your own shit or to get my help to fix your shit. But for those of you who are called to go out and fix other people's shit, that's a special kind of stupid. Right? It's not work you choose. It's work that chooses you. I'll, I'll let you know. God backdoored me on this one, dudes. I'm telling you. I, if you'd asked, if you'd have told me ten years, I'd be seeing patients five days a week, doing what I do. Twenty years ago, 
I'd have laughed at you. Because all I wanted to do was do martial arts, pick up women, and be cool. <laughs> God had other plans. And God always does. But the secret, a lot of people ask me, I need to find out what my mission in life is. What's my mission? Depends on how you feel that day. Depends on how you feel that day. The fastest way to find your mission is follow your passion. <coughs> follow the things that feed your spirit. You'll discover your mission right before you leave this planet. <laughs> or right after you leave this planet, and you'll say, ah, I did it! Right? God gave us the best GPS we could ever have. It's called our neurology. It's called our system of feelings. The universe works in a language of feelings and pictures and holograms. All of this information is, in fact, holographic. Okay? Um, let me see if I can... I'm going to try to do this in a very... Uh, I'm going to diagram it as best I can. And hopefully I can explain tr the trauma induction process in a way that we can... Now, NLP comes at this hologram from a very different place. When the, the neurology creates a, tra a, a uh, trauma container... Kind of every time I think of a trauma container, I think of, you ever see Ghostbusters? Yeah. That little container they had that held the ghost in it? That's what I think about, right? This little container with all this shit floating around inside of it. But think about it this way this is the line of your memory and awareness, right? And it fluctuates from state to state to state. Now, the interesting thing happens is that let's say that this is baseline, right? We find moments of trauma. Let me um, move this up a little bit. David, how do you spell Brent's last name? B-A-U-M. B-A-U-M. Now, a trauma looks like this. It's a spike, an emotional spike in our system. All right? There's a certain level of neurological arousal. Now, what's happening is this is zero hour. This is terminal event. T0, right? This would be the moment of maximum emotional trauma and death. Okay? An interesting thing happens is our consciousness is pretty consistent. Our ego states are pretty consistent. As the trauma increases, there's a mechanism within our system that monitors till it gets to what we call T minus 1. T minus one is that moment just before the critical terminal event. And then the neurology does something amazingly cool. It turns it off. It literally zips that file <coughs> and all the trauma in it into a container that it stores somewhere in your nervous system. When I had you point to where you feel it, you found the somatic address. When I had you notice the color, you started to bring out attributes of the container. Follow me? Now, within this universe, that moment, that ego state, that consciousness, that event is frozen in time. And it's happening over and over and over again. But it's quarantined within the neurology. It's quarantined within the body. And over time, the way your neurological sorting system begins to do things is it sorts things by similarities. It sorts things by things that have in common. That's why many times when you start to do these processes, you wind up somewhere completely different. Because it's not linear. It's not logical. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. That ego state is a fragment of your consciousness. Holographic in nature, which means it's got everything that you knew and everything that you had and everything that you understood up to that moment in time. But for all intents and purposes, it's a separate organism. And we know it's not. It's a container. When we, either as, through the process of hypnotic regression, through some form of neuro-linguistic programming, or like Brent uses a holographic memory resolution process. From the present moment, 
By the way, once we hit trauma, a T minus one, that gets frozen in time. Now, one of two things either happens here at T zero. You're either dead or you survived. If you survive, the consciousness keeps going from that point forward. This is why you have blank spots in your memory from time to time. Those, those blank spots indicate containers that have been taken out offline until such a time as you have the resources. You have the resources to deal with it. Or if you don't handle this shit, it's going to overload the system. Does that make sense? Okay. So how do we do this? Well, um, well I don't want to get I don't want to get too long, so I'm gonna um, I should just, just do some shit. And, I, don't know, God, I never know what I'm getting when I open up this can of worms. Um, so here's what I want to do. Let's do this as a group exercise. Can we do this as a group exercise? I want you to think of something. Well, no, it's not going to work either because I got to manage each of these. So here's what we're going to do. We point to where we feel it. We notice there's a color connected to that feeling. Right? We've, we've, we've gotten that far. Right? We're going to take a little bit of Brent's approach now in that once we find the color, once we find the somatic address, now what I want you to do is I want you to look at it with your inner eyes and I want you to trace the periphery of that event or of that feeling. Notice the shape of it. As you notice the shape of it, tell me about the shape or, or describe that shape. What's it like? Right? Julia, what's yours like? Tell Jagged. Me. Jagged? Can you come up here for a second? Sure. Bring your chair. <laughs> Yes. When you said noticing, is that still like where you're pointing yep. to? Yep. We start with where we point it. I'm, give, I'm giving you my approach to this. This is not specifically Brent's because this is a little bit more convoluted. But it's still within that point. Yeah. That well, watch closely. As uh, Julia, close your eyes. Point okay. to where you feel it. Okay. Note it. What's the color? Green. Excellent. And you said, what's the shape of it again? It's kind of square, rectangle, and square, jagged. Square, rectangle, and jagged. So it's square, rectangle, and jagged. Tell me about jagged that shape. Edge. What's it like? Um, like it's like this, except the edges are okay. Like a ripped. Very paper. cool. So let me ask you a question: Is it in your body, outside of your body, partial or partially in and partially out? Mm, outside. Okay. So here's what I want you to do: I want you to look deep into that green energy, into that green jagged square thing. I want you to follow it to its very center, to the very source of it. And when you get there, just nod your head to let me know. And I want you to follow it even further. Now back to the, the, the root cause, the very first scene, situation, or event. That is the source of that, cut, that jagged green energy. And when you get there, nod your head and let me know. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Are you inside or outside, first impression? Inside. Are you alone or with people? With people. Is it daytime or nighttime? Nighttime. Look around. Look at your hands in that picture. Are they big girl hands or little girl hands? Little. That's right. About how old are you when you're looking at your hands? Ten. Ten, that's right. So as you look around and what's going on, tell me what's happening. There's just people around talking. There's people around talking, that's right. And as people are just around talking, what happens next? I do something that makes them look at me. You do something that makes them look at you, mm -hmm. and then what happens? It was bad. It was bad. Yeah. Okay, and if it was bad, what happens next? I feel bad. You feel bad. And when you feel bad, what happens then? Nothing, really. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you could go back in time and give that little girl the best advice that would make everything all better, what would you tell her? That it doesn't matter. Okay. It's okay. It's okay? Cool. I want you to step into that scene as the you of today, okay. complete with all your knowledge, all of your life experience, all your wisdom. I want you to give her a big-ass hug. Let her know that no matter where she goes, no matter what she does, you're always going to be there. You're always going to be with her. That you love her. You're going to take care of her. And let her know especially that you're from the year 2016 and life gets pretty cool. <laughs> right? And tell her everything she's going to need to know, everything she's going to need to understand to be okay. To feel great inside. And when you know she's got that, just nod your head to let me know.
nice one. Now, as you look at her, is she happy? Yes. Now, I've got a quick question for you. What would make her the happiest little camper on the face of the planet right now? <laughs> okay. Well, if you could imagine, what would she like to have? What would you like to experience? The. Go ahead. <laughs> I guess the um, approval of the people around. I want you to make a movie in your mind that has the highest approval rating ever. I want you to make it full color, high def. Make it the best approval movie ever. She's a rock star. I want you to play that movie over and over again. And when it's perfect in every way, I want you to you would take her by the hand. I want her to step into that movie and live it. Over and over. That's right. You can feel good. <laughs> That's right. Feel it over and over and over again. And now I want you to notice as you feel those good feelings, <coughs> that there's a place in your body where that feeling starts. Point to where you feel it. The same way. That's right. And I want you to notice there's a color connected to that good feeling. What's that color? Fuchsia? Fuchsia, perfect. Now, I want you to imagine that movie is now playing out in front of you, bigger than an IMAX movie theater screen. I mean, it's huge, right? And I want you to make it, now you look at the movie. Is it really, really clear or is it kind of fuzzy? Kind of fuzzy. I want you to play with all the different controls until that movie becomes crystal clear in every way. And when you know you've got it, nod your head to it. Okay. Excellent. Is it crystal clear? Yes. High def? Yes. All right. Now what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that fuchsia energy projecting out and forming a big frame around that movie. And I want you to take a snapshot of it. And as you do, I want you to reach out with both of your hands and grab the edges of that frame and the picture inside of it. Physically reach out and lift it up over your head. I want you to pull it down through your entire being over and over and over again. And notice what happens to that green jagged shape in your tummy. I don't see it. Oh. Just keep going until it's completely gone. And it's impossible to feel it ever again. And let whatever feelings come up as a result, let it just come up. It's okay. This is the time. This is the place. Take a tour of your body and notice how different you feel. What do you notice? Well, as I was noticing that green, it was like in my chest. Oh, it moved, like, huh? Uh-huh. All right. Yeah. Notice there's and a color. And it's not there anymore. That's not there anymore? No, because that's when you were talking about it down here. I was like, oh, that's funny. I feel like somebody's stepping on my chest. And now it's gone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So grab your picture again. Okay. Do about 10 or 20 more passes and notice what happens. And double the size of the picture as you do it. And then double it again. Keep doubling the size of the image as you draw it through your body. That's right. That's what I'm talking about right there, baby. <laughs> Till it's impossible to feel any other way, you notice what happens. Take a tour of your body, notice how different. What do you notice? Sweating. You're sweating. <laughs> yeah. Try to bring those old feelings back. Notice what happens instead. Nothing. It stays future. Open your eyes. Notice how good you feel. Give okay. everybody a round of applause. Thank you. You're welcome. Whether the trauma is, you know, something from a war zone or something that happened on the playground, something that happened in the living room. The mechanics are the same. You don't need, with this process, you don't need to re-dredge up the trauma and things like that. Those, those techniques are there if we need to use them. But it's important to remember that every memory that we have is a hologram. And it's a container at the same time for the emotional energy that was present at the time the scene was recorded. And it's that energy that is expressed holographically, that is connected to every other part of the body holographically. Uh, and you guys, you guys all know how a hologram actually works, right? 
A hologram is literally um, where they take a beam of light and they split it and they send one beam to an object and the other beam to, I think it's a mirror or something like that, and uh, to a, pho a photographic plate. And then because of the angles and the way the beams are split, what is imprinted on that photographic plate is a three-dimensional representation of the image. And, but the actual three-dimensionality of the image doesn't emerge until you shine a light through it. And all of a sudden you have a three-dimensional image. The interesting thing about holograms is that if you took that, that image and you cut it in half, all of the information from both sides of the hologram would be present in both of the pictures. And you could keep dividing it and it would be the same, the same, the same. No matter how many times you divided it down, the whole would be contained in the part. Acupuncture and oriental medical theory has actually embraced this idea for a very long time. But now we're discovering that the very nature of our universe is holographic. Our memories and the way our neurology works is holographic. NLP, which has been around since the 70s, has approached the hologram through its component parts, the brick and mortar that we use to construct it, the visuals, the auditories, the kinesthetics, the olfactories. What Brent's approach was is very different. His took on a more metaphorical approach in that when people describe their problem or they describe their pain, they describe it using a metaphor, mostly a shape. Sometimes it's an actual object that was in the environment. But no matter what they use to describe it, that metaphor is the container. It's the container that keeps all of that stuff circulating and stored. And you can use a metaphor to change a metaphor. You can use one hologram to change another hologram. And so the antidote for a lot of these things, A, you inject into the container a new awareness, a new consciousness of somebody who survived. Because remember, terminal event hasn't happened yet. They still think they're in danger. They don't know that they survive. They don't know that they survive. The, just the act of injecting another consciousness that inserts new information of survival changes things. Then you give that particular ego state, they like to call it, but it's really a, a, a hologram of your consciousness at that moment. You inject new information into that sealed environment and everything starts to change. And then you figure out what states or feelings resolve what's remaining. And you use that frame, that hologram, to connect and contact all the other fragments of that holographic representation. It all happened. Point to where you feel it, notice the color, go inside, right? That alone would have, in, a, in, in our regular approaches to most forms of hypnotherapy, would have been a 20-minute process. Back there, but just getting to that point where you can actually begin that kind of work. And then actually jettisoning or venting the stored emotion would be however long it took, right? This whole process took minutes, right? It's this, the, the irony is we're still doing a lot of the same things we would do in conventional hypnotherapy. We're just using different metaphors and tools to do it. NLP did it, one of, the, one of its big, um, uh, cut, or, <clears throat> big claims to fame was the, the, the revelation of a personal timeline a holographic sorting system that your nervous system uses to separate present from past from future. Right? And they could do really cool things with timeline. The problem a lot of times with timeline, though, was if you couldn't jettison the emotional charge, you couldn't get them the change to stick. And because NLP tends to specialize in what we call light trance states, um, a lot of the old hypnotherapeutic approaches tended to work better because they involve deeper levels of trance. Okay, but that's how trauma. That's one of the ways that we can resolve trauma. Another way we can do it is we can point to where we feel it, take it out, spin it the other way, and put it back in. Still works faster than this. But sometimes we need to take a structural approach. In other words, how is that particular container built? The visuals, the auditory, the kinesthetics, the olfactories. Is it too close to the body? Right. That's one way we can affect it. We can affect it through the story of what happened. 
And we go in and we, we ask what happened, what happened, what happened. I try to, when I work, I try to work with as little information as I can, but sometimes I need to know a little bit of the story so I can direct and navigate. Um, and we change the story because you're allowed to change the story. It's just shit that happened. And since you're in charge of the video, and you're in charge of the editing deck, and you're the only one that's ever going to know, or care for that matter, you have the right and the authority to change it to whatever you want so that when you remember the past, you only remember it in ways that make your life better. Remember, we aren't the way we are because of the things that happened. That's a cop-out, even though we don't know it's a cop-out. We are the way we are because of the way we think about the things that happen, about the way we choose to remember them. And it is a choice. We didn't know we had a choice, but it's still a choice. Right? As I like to say, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Right? This is how our system works. And I've, I've done this now with uh, emotional eating. I've done it with, I did a 45 minute uh, smoke cessation with this. Where I literally took the guy back to the very first reason, his very first motivation to start to start smoking, and I asked the little, I asked him to tell it, to give that little boy, uh, you know, everything he would need to know to, to not smoke anymore. And the problem we had was he wanted to smoke because he wanted to be like his dad. Now, nah, what do you do about that shit, right? So I said, well, what would have to happen for him to decide he didn't want to smoke anymore? Well, we'd have to experience the the disgust first time, you know, the first time you smoke a cigarette, it's never pleasant, right? And so he literally made uh, the, the worst movie ever of, of going through that first puff. And he literally pulled it through him over and over and over again until a little boy just decided, I don't want to do that anymore. From start to finish, it took 45 minutes. By the end of the session, I couldn't even get him to touch the cigarettes in his pocket. Okay. Here's the one thing to remember. The most important reasons for people to do the things they say they want to do are their own. What the neurology generates, the neurology accepts. Whatever metaphors your neurology uses to express something. If I tell you to go to a gray room, a dome-shaped room with pearly gray walls, and you find yourself in an oblong room with, pink, with a pink ceiling and a fuzzy you know, rug, that's how your nervous system does it. It's not wrong. We tend to make ourselves wrong if our internal experience doesn't match the guidance we're receiving. You as therapists need to be, have the, the, the behavioral flexibility to work with whatever metaphors of trauma or resolution that your client generates. Does that make sense? Yes? Just a question, David, on um, with what you did with Julia. Mm -hmm. A uh, book I read said, you know, what to do, what to say when you talk to yourself. Could you do that in a conversation with yourself on those questions? Would that still... Yeah, as long as you can uh, enter the appropriate state and do the work, yes. Yeah. All of these things can be done as self or auto-hypnosis or self-generated resolution. The problem is, is that there's a part of us, uh, the big problem we have with any of these processes, whether it's... Uh, doing it for ourselves or doing it with other people is the problem of compliance and absorption. You see, there's this, this thing, this, this process that rears its ugly head. It's called smart person syndrome or hypnotist disease, depending on how much training you've had. Okay? Smart person syndrome is that part of us that a doesn't think, is, wants to prove it doesn't work, happens every now and then. We don't usually get those kind of people. But more often than not, it's people who want to kind of be in the experience, observe the experience, and analyze and judge the experience while having it. Well, if there's a part of you that's trying to do the process, another part of you that's trying to evaluate what's going on and learn, another part of you that's evaluating whether it's working or not, how absorbed are you in that process? The answer is you're not. To the degree that you lack absorption in the process is the degree it will take you longer to get this. The minute you start engaging the soma, the body, a lot of that starts to go away because you can't get the body involved without becoming progressively more absorbed. I have stories for that. Um, the other part is focus, right? Um, because a lot of times we tend to exist at the same level as our trauma, from a, a logical level's perspective, it's very hard for us many times to rise above it and change it, right? So we can use that metaphorical approach, that uh, neuro-linguistic holographic grid approach that we talked about, to create an interface, 
an imaginative construct which actually has actual physiological origins. Your proprioception and your mirror neurons play a massive role in the facilitation of this. And from that construct, using metaphor and structure, we can change what the neurology is doing. We can revisit any moment in time, as long as we understand the dynamics of unconscious response. It always feels like you're making it up. It's the first answer you get, regardless of how illogical or nonlinear it may seem. You're always going to have an urge to edit it, right? And it's always quiet. It's always in the background. Right? There's an old saying that the, the conscious mind yells, the unconscious mind whispers. But remember, at the end of the day, if you can feel it and point to it, you can change it. Okay? So um, we are coming up on 10 minutes to 3. That is almost 50 minutes beyond our end date. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Give yourselves a massive round of applause. One of my parting gifts to you, if you didn't get a gift certificate, or actually even if you did get a gift certificate, you still get this gift. Um, every client I see, my, my regular rates are 175 an hour. Some of you know this, painfully so. Um, uh, but everybody who came out tonight, as my gift to you for coming out, sitting through the talks, eating our food, having a good time, uh, everybody gets a, a free 30-minute consultation with me. It's my gift, but you do have to schedule it, okay, because I have a waiting list sometimes three weeks long. It's been crazy the past couple of weeks. Um, but it's, it's, good, it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem. We have a whole bunch of new stuff uh, in the works in terms of <laughs> programs, in terms of opportunities for training and getting your stuff handled and whatever. Uh, but there are computer stations set up throughout the, uh, the clinic. You can sign yourself up or talk to Tracy or Candy or Alex, and they'll be happy to uh, get you scheduled. Uh, I don't promise to fix anybody's problem in the consult because I don't take everyone. I evaluate every single person who comes to me to find out if what you have is a fit for what we do. If it's a fit, I'll discuss strategies with you for getting your situation handled in the shortest amount of time possible. If it's not a fit, I will make recommendations where I think you might find the help that you need. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Cool. Thank you all for coming out. Post good things to the meetup, or if not, post to somebody else's. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.